Welcome, my name is Pastor Scotty Bockhaus, and we thank you for taking some time to listen to some audio recordings from the pulpit of the Riverview Baptist Church. Our desire is to show the Lord high, holy, and lift it up, as well as try to be a blessing to those through the Word of God. Please enjoy this message, and we pray that it will be a blessing to your life. And if you wouldn't mind to take your copy of the Word of God and turn with me to the Old Testament book of Ezra. The Old Testament book of Ezra and Ezra in chapter number 9. The book of Ezra and chapter number 9. Well, as we continue with our Resurrection Sunday, we took some time this morning to explore the mysteries of the cross, that Jesus dying for our sins and bore our sins upon his body to give us salvation full, free, and forever. And as we continue with that same idea and observing the Lord's Supper, the Memorial Supper, we understand that one of the important parts of the Memorial Supper is the idea of examining ourselves, making sure that we're as thoroughly right with God as possible. That the natural state of a church should be revival. And whenever a church is not in revival, we are in an abnormal state, at least compared to what God desires us to be. Now we understand that in order for us to have revival, in order for us to have God's spirit, in order for us to be dead to self, that sin must be examined, that sin must be exposed, and sin must be confessed. As we turn to the book of Ezra in chapter number 9, we come to to one of the most important prayers of revival found in entire scripture. In fact, this whole prayer that we see in Ezra chapter 9 would be a good prayer for you to develop the habit of praying for, especially when you are taking the time to examine yourselves and to seek after revival. If you don't mind, let's go ahead and read this text and see what it says, and then we'll dive into it in some more specifics. The book of Ezra in the Old Testament in chapter number 9, and let's begin starting at verse number 1. The book of Ezra chapter 9 in verse number 1. Now when these things were done, the princes came to me saying, The people of Israel and the priest and the Levites have not separated themselves from the people of the lands, doing according to their abominations, even of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Ammonites, the Moabites, the Egyptians, and the Amorites. For they have taken of their daughters for themselves and their sons, so that the holy seed have mingled themselves with the people of those lands. Yea, and the hand of the princes and the rulers have been chief in this trespass. And when I heard this thing, I rent my garment and my mantle and plucked off the hair of my head and of my beard and sat down a stone. And when er, then were assembled unto me every one that trembled at the words of the God of Israel because of the transgression of those that had been carried away. And I sat a stone until the evening sacrifice. And at the evening sacrifice, I arose up from my heaviness. And having rent my garment and my mantle, I fell upon my knees and spread out my hands unto the Lord my God and said, O oh my God, I am ashamed and blush to lift up my face to thee, my God. For our iniquities are increased over our head, and our trespass is grown up unto the heavens. Since the days of our fathers have we been in this great trespass unto this day, and for our iniquities have we, our kings and our priests, have been delivered into the hand of the king kings of the land, to the sword, to the captivity, and to a spoil, and to the confusion of face as it is this day. And now, for a little space, grace hath been showed from the Lord our God, to leave us a remnant to escape. And to give us a nail in his holy place. That our God may lighten our eyes and give us a little reviving in our bondage. For we were bondmen. 
Yet our God hath not forsaken us in our bondage, but hath extended mercy unto us in the sight of the kings of Persia to give us a reviving, to set up the house of our God and to repair the desolations thereof and to give us a wall in Ju Judah and in Jerusalem. And now, O oh our God, what shall we say after this? For we have forsaken thy commandments, which thou hast commanded by thy servants the prophets, saying, The land unto which you go to possess it is an unclean land, and with the filthiness of the people of the lands, with their abominations, which have filled it from one end to another with their uncleanness. Now therefore give not your daughters unto their sons, neither take their daughters unto your sons, nor seek out their peace or their wealth forever, that ye may be strong and eat the good of the land and leave it for an inheritance to your children forever. And after that, and after all of that has come upon us, for our evil deeds and for our great trespass, seeing that thou, our God, has punished us less than our iniquities deserve and has given on us such deliverance as this. Should we again break thy commandments and join in affinity with the people of these abominations? Wouldest not thou be angry with us until thou hast consumed us, so that there should be no remnant nor escaping? O Lord God in Israel, thou art righteous, for we remain yet escaped as it is this day. Behold, we are before thee in our trespass. We cannot stand before thee because of this. And if you're in the habit of marking things in your Bible, would you mark a phrase that we find in the book of Ezra chapter number 9? The book of Ezra chapter 9, and notice with me in verse number 6, the beginning of this prayer. Notice with me in verse number 6 where he says, I am ashamed and blush. I am ashamed and blush. If you don't mind, let's go to the Lord together and let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you again for you being a wonderful God. And as we come up to you now, we're just asking that you would give us grace and understanding and mercy. Help us now as we examine ourselves and as we seek after revival. Help that to be our heart cry. Help it to be the desire of our heart to see you do something that you and you alone can do. I'm asking that again as we seem to have this theme all day. Help us to be dependent upon you desiring you, seeking you, and that we would be clean vessels in your hands. Fill me with your spirit even now and let this message and this meeting matter for eternity as you do a work in our midst, in our lives. Thank you, Lord, that we could trust you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, as we examine Ezra chapter 9. We're going to take some time to look at the prayer itself, but I think it would be good to grab some context of what has happened. Inside of the history of Israel, God has placed the Hebrew people into a land, and He gave them very specific instructions that they were not supposed to intermarry. They were not supposed to hang out with the heathen. They were not supposed to um, uh, do the things of the heathen. Now, let's pause. Why would he say that? Is God trying to raise up a group of people to make them feel like I am better than you and God has chosen me? No, that's not the idea of all. You see, what is the idea is that God knows the heart of man. And he understands that when we as God's people end up being with the world and start to enjoy the world's things and start to hang out with unsaved people and start to befriend and marry with them that instead of us pulling them up, they pull us down. You say, well, what's the big deal of that? Because it all deals with our idea of worship of God. How we view God, how we see God, and how we trust God. You see, the world is against the Lord. The world is against everything God stands for. And so, when we start getting comfortable with the world, and we start to intermingle, and we lose our separation, 
then what happens is that we start to enjoy what the world enjoys. We start to do the things that the world does and our eyes get off the Lord and turns to another little G God. You say, but listen, we live in the 21st century. We're not worried about little idols. I understand we're not worried about idols, but we have little G gods that people will not follow after God because of a ball game. People will not go to church because their favorite TV show is on. People will skip because of their hobby. People will skip because of this. They won't read their Bible because they're too busy checking their Facebook status. And what happens is that their hearts are so far away from God. This is why God has made this commandment all throughout the Bible, Old Testament, New Testament, from come out from among them and be separate. He's not bringing a group of people that think they're better than everyone else. But he is bringing a group of people who are different because their goal is God, while everyone else's goal is something else. And so God worked with the people of Israel all the way through the Bible. And you could see as God is trying to bring them back to himself, bring them back to himself, bring them back to himself. And they keep wandering away. They continually serve other gods other than the God of the Bible. They continue to serve and go after everything else because it's more entertaining, because it brings me more pleasure, because I think it's easier. And the whole time their eyes get away from the Lord. And this is the problem. This is the big deal. Is that there is a true and living God. And he wants his people to worship him. And him alone. And so God warning them. And warning them. And by the way, God has been a patient God. And that he gave them a thousand years where he tried to work with them. And he tried to work with them. And he tried to work with them. And he tried to work with them. Until finally it just got to the place where he said, I'm done. And in 586 BC, he sent a heathen empire called the Babylonian Empire to come and destroy the the country of Judah, destroy the city of Jerusalem, destroy the temple that had God's name on it. And then he carried them away to heathen lands. And they were mixed around with those heathen lands for 70 years. Now you say, what's the big deal out of this? Well, we know in the book of Habakkuk, we're not going to turn there, but right before the destruction came, God told the prophet Habakkuk, who was praying for a revival as well, And he answered the um, prophet's prayer and said, I will work a work in your days that even if I told you, you would not believe me. He says, all right, what are you going to do about our country? What are you going to do about it falling apart? You understand the just... Uh, judges don't do what's right. There are so many people doing evil that even the laws aren't kept. The courts rule against it. Everything's corrupt. What are we going to do? And God says, I'm going to do a work. And if I told you what it was, you wouldn't believe me. He says, okay, tell me what it is. Ye among the heathen, I'm going to take Babylon and destroy your country. How is that going to solve everything? They're worse than we are. God says, I told you you wouldn't believe me. And God did a work where their problem was is that they served other gods other than God. And he put them in a country where they served even more gods. But somehow, some way, because of God's infinite knowledge... They came back and became the most monotheistic people there were. God knew what he was doing. Well, as they come back, Ezra has helped uh, rebuild things. They've had the temple rebuilt. They've reestablished the worship. They're now putting the walls around the city. And now he finds that the people are starting to creep back into their old ways. That the people have started to, to go out and date unbelievers to go out and enjoy the same thing that the lost world enjoys and he could see the pattern of what's happening especially since it's not just the everyday people it's the leadership that is doing so and they realize that this is exactly what God punished them for and what do you know they're doing the same thing again how can they stand before God And this is the background of the prayer. This is the background of what's happening. The problem is, is something called presumptuous 
sins. What is a presumptuous sin? It is a sin that I knowingly do presuming on God's grace, presuming that God is not going to punish me for it. I know it's wrong. I know it's against God. But you know, nothing's going to happen. And I do it presuming on God's grace. And blatant. So it's not accidental. It's not out of ignorance. Well, I didn't know better. These people are following into a sin that not only do they know better, they were just punished for. If you could imagine, if we could bring it to a simpler definition, could you imagine a parent taking a child and saying, this is the rules, don't do this. The child says, all right, and goes, do it. And the child continues to do it till finally the parent has enough and he brings a punishment with the purpose, you understand what you did. Yes, this is what the punishment you deserve and give him the punishment. Rightfully so, every good child, uh, father will chasten his, his child. Then, after the child just finishes getting the spanking, take it outside the woodshed, whatever colloquial term you want to use, the child goes off and does the same thing immediately afterwards. Would you think the parent was going to be happy about that? Do you think the parent's like, oh, bless his heart, how cute? No, not at all. And this is the stance that they're in. They have just got through being chastised by God. They just finished and was restoring, and immediately the disobedient child went out and did it again. And so with this, we find the prayer of Ezra confessing and talking to God about this heartbreaking situation. If you don't mind, let's examine the book of Ezra and the prayer specifically. Notice with me, if you don't mind, as we started off, notice in verse number four as we just lead up to this prayer. Then were assembled unto me every one that trembled at the words of the Lord God of Israel, because of the transgression of those that carried away. And I sat as stoned even into the evening sacrifice. Well, this is just something as we're praying for revival, that the idea of revival is letting a few people, and it may not, doesn't have to be many, get thoroughly right with God. When we observe the Lord's Supper, this is our desire, is that we know that we don't have everyone here. But we're praying that everyone here has a desire to be thoroughly right with God. Not playing games, not just showing up just because I'm supposed to, but having the idea that I want to be as thoroughly right with God as I can be. Notice as we go into it in verse number 5. And an evening sacrifice I arose and up from my heaviness, and having rent my garment and my mantle, I fell down upon my knees and spread out my hands unto the Lord my God. Verse 6. And said, as he begins to pray, O oh my God, I am ashamed and blush to lift my face to thee, my God. Why? For our iniquities are increased over our head and our trespasses grown up under the heaven. As we start off, we see that this word blush. This word blush is only used three times in scripture. Twice it's used in Jeremiah before the destruction of Jerusalem when the people were still thinking they can get away and serving other gods, getting away and doing whatever they want. Jeremiah says this phrase twice in chapter 6 and chapter 8 where he says, Were they ashamed when they committed abomination? Nay, they were not at all ashamed. Neither could they blush. It had the ideas, both of those contexts go on. That the people were not only sinning, but they were choosing the sin. They knew that was going to aggravate God and saying, what's he going to do about it? They're at the place now where they're not only doing their sin, they're not ashamed of their sin, and they're bragging about our sin. Do you know about 60 years ago, it was a public shame in America for someone to be publicly intoxicated? It was very much considered an shame. Today, it's bragging rights. Man, I got trashed this weekend, and I just, oh, it was horrible. I want to do it again. And they brag about their sin. 
<laughs> you know, we can name different sins. I, and, and we're not trying to go call out. It's easy to call out the sins that we quote unquote aren't doing. But just as an example, today, uh, the other day I saw someone that was saying that abortion is a very much a traumatic event. But we don't need to be celebrate it by itself. We should have a party and here's a cake and let's get together and celebrate the, the thing that we had. Now again, it's easy to say other people's sins, but you, how, you understand how lying in America is bragged upon and promote it very much so. How stealing seems to be something that's very commonplace if you could get away with it. That the idea of adultery is rampant. There was a, a ladies meeting. <laughs> they were having a private meeting at a restaurant. And someone came up to this group of ladies. There was 10 ladies there. And a man came up and said, I'm just doing a quiz. How many of you have ever committed adultery, cheated on your husband? Nine out of the ten women raised their hand. One woman, when she got home, uh, told her husband about it and said, I just want to let you know that I raised my hand. Now, I've never committed adultery, but because everyone else raised their hand, I felt like I would be outcast if I did not admit to it. You understand, these things are commonplace. And not only are they commonplace, they're easing into the church. Where church people are having no problems. Now again, I'm just naming a couple, but I'm saying we are so full of sin. And we're not ashamed of it. And there's something wrong when we're no longer ashamed of our sin. It is a bad position to be in when we're no longer ashamed of our sin. So here is Ezra. Who goes before God. And notice again what he says in verse 6. And said oh my God. I am ashamed. And blush. To lift up my face to thee. He says God I can't even look up at you. I have to keep my face to the ground. Because I know how guilty we are. I know how guilty I am. I know that I am not right. And how can I look up to you knowing how much my sins, my iniquities have grown up to the heavens. And he goes on in verse 7 and describes a little bit more of their background. But notice in verse number 8, this is key. He says, now for a little space, grace hath been showed from the Lord our God to leave us a remnant to escape to give us a nail in his holy place that our God may lighten our eyes and give us a little reviving in our bondage. You know God has given us a small time of freedom. We have a small time where we have the freedom to come to church. We have the freedom to read our Bible. You understand not everyone in the world has this freedom. If you are found with an Uzbek Bible in Uzbekistan, three years in prison. You understand that if you are found in Uzbekistan inside with five or more people inside of your apartment, it is a legal meeting, three, day, three years in prison. By the way, that's repeated in countries all over the place. We have a small amount of freedom. And you know what we do with our freedom? Do everything but serve God. We don't use our freedom to get closer to God. We don't use our freedom to read our Bible. In fact, we have to have preachers that are begging people, will you please read your Bible? Please read your Bible. The greatest thing you can do is you read your Bible. And we have all of this freedom. We have the freedom to go to church. We have the freedom to respond to God. We have the freedom to tell people about the Lord. And you know what we do with our freedom? We waste it. God has given us a little space for the freedom to have revival. And we waste it. How can we stand before God when he has given us time and we don't take advantage of it? We are guilty. Now again, he is confessing. He is admitting to God that we're not right. He's admitting to God that something's wrong. He's admitting to God. He's confessing that these need to change. Notice as he goes on in verse number 9. He says, for we were bondmen, yet our God had not forsaken us in our bondage. Aren't you thankful for that God, that God didn't wipe his hands off? He could have wiped his hands off of Judah and said, you know what, I'm done, I'm done, I'm just going to start all over. 
But no, he continued to work through them, through the hard times that they had. And he was bringing them to the place where they could be used of him again. But notice, he had extended mercy unto us in the sight of the kings of Persia. To give us a reviving, to set up the house of our God, to repair the desolations thereof. And to give us a wall in Judah and Jerusalem. We're thankful that God has extended mercy to us. And he has given us mercy. And he's given this mercy so we have the freedom to return to him. To recognize the Bible speaks about the the goodness of God leadeth to repentance. When you think about how good God has been to you. It should bring you to the place where you want to be good to him back. We have that response of love. He has loved us first and we love him in response. Notice as it goes on. Verse number 10. And now, O oh our God, what should we say after this? For we have forsaken thy commandments. When we openly and purposely sin, what justification could you give? Now, I deal with people all the time who love to justify their sin. Well, the reason why I cheated on my husband is because, how can you justify that? Well, the reason why I cheat on my taxes is because how can you justify? How can you ever justify doing wrong? And yet, isn't it amazing how we attempt to? All the time. By the way, that's part of our problem. Is that we try to explain away our sin. And try to give a justification why I'm not faithful. The just, well, why didn't you read your Bible? Well, you have to understand, I'm just so busy. When you stand before God, how is that going to fly? We would be a lot better served if we would just be honest with God rather than trying to lie to God and make excuses why we are not obedient. Verse number 11. Which thou hast commanded by the servants, the prophets, saying into the land. And here in verse number 11 and 12, he talks about the separation. That God has given us clear rules of separation. And with those clear rules, how can we break them knowingly? When he said, don't do that. Don't cross this line. Don't spend time with them. Don't marry an unbeliever. Don't be unequally yoked with an unbeliever. Be, be with people who are going to go forward with God. Don't yoke yourself. Don't put yourself in a place where you're going to have someone who doesn't want to serve God. The Bible is clear with these rules and the understanding of it that he wants our heart to be purely following after God and have no excuse not to. Notice as it goes on in verse number 13. And after all... (laughs) <laughs> and after all that has come upon us for our evil deeds and for our great trespass, seeing that thou, our God, has punished us less. He has punished us less than our iniquities deserve and has given us such deliverance as us. Do you know what we deserve for one little lie? We deserve an awful place called hell. That God has punished us less than we deserve. And knowing that he has punished us less than we deserve. How can we turn around and purposely sin against him? Knowing he showed us such grace and mercy the first time around. Verse number 14. Should we again break thy commandments and join in affinity with the people of these abomination? Wouldest not thou be angry with us till thou hast consumed us so that there should be no remnant nor escaping? Verse number 14, very clear. If we openly and purposely sinned against God again, God has every right to take us out. He does. This should give us pause. Now again, this is the purpose. What is the purpose of this? God is not trying to get to the place where we're just so (coughs) um, broken down people in the hands of a mean God. Instead, the opposite's true. He's trying to get our eyes on God and let us see the goodness of it. And see that 
His commandments, they are not grievous. They're not burdensome. They are not horrible chains. Some people say, well, if I follow the Bible, if I get saved, if I become a Christian, I just have all these restrictions. No, no, no. The world sold you a box of lies. When you get saved, you have more liberty than you could ever imagine. God is not being awful to us. He is being good to us. He is being gracious to us. But we see his sovereignty that he has the right to do with with what he owns. What do you mean he owns? He first of all created you. He owns you because he created you. Second of all, if you've accepted him as personal savior, he bought you with his blood. He purchased you. You are twice owned by God. And he has every right to do with what he wants. With what he owns. We are his servants. We understand that later on, we'll talk more about the millennial kingdom and talk about that. But you understand that we're going to be judged one day for how good of a servant we are. How obedient we are. Think of the idea of an employer. If you are an employer and you have an employee that refuses to show up at work and when he shows up to work, he lollygags, is not where he's supposed to. Is that a good employee? Are you going to reward him and say, good job, I'm so glad you're on the payroll? Not at all. We are supposed to be the servants of the Lord. He's our boss. He has every right to tell us what to do. Not because he's a mean, vindictive God, but because he is a God who created us and loved us. Our response to him should be proper terms. Not on our terms, but on his terms. We are the one unreasonable when we are not following after God. God's not unreasonable. We are. And this is what this prayer of Ezra is all about. Understanding I am guilty. Verse 15. O Lord God of Israel, thou art righteous, for we remain yet escaped as it is this day. Behold, we are before thee in our trespass. We cannot stand before thee because of this. Notice Ezra in verse 15 says, O Lord, thou art righteous. He's admitting that, listen, it's not me that's, it's not you that's wrong, it's me. You're right in this. You're God. You set the rules. I am the one that's wrong. I'm the one that needs to be fixed. Now, I understand when we say this, most of the time we have flesh that starts raising up. Our flesh hates this message because you know what our flesh likes to? It likes to be right. It even likes to be right enough to tell God what to do and that I'm justified to do this. If we'd be honest, that's our flesh. Our flesh hates this. Because our flesh hates to admit that someone has the right to tell us what to do. Our flesh hates the idea that we have to submit to anything, much less God. But yet, if we want revival, we have to admit the truth that God is God. And we are not. He's the one who justifies. He's the one who judges. He's the one that sets the rules of righteousness not us. You say, well, how does this relate to the Lord's Supper? I'm glad you asked. Turn with me, if you don't mind, to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter number 11. The book of 1 Corinthians chapter number 11. And with this, we could see as the Apostle Paul is taking pen and paper in hand by the inspiration and the guidance of the Holy Spirit to correct the church of Corinth because they are doing the Lord's Supper incorrectly. And whereas we're sorry that the church messed up, we are thankful that it is recorded so we can understand exactly the purpose of the Lord's Supper and what it's supposed to do. Now, as we turn to uh, 1 Corinthians 11, we also have to underscore that the Lord's Supper in conjunction with biblical baptism are for the local church. What do I mean by that? 
when someone becomes biblically baptized, they first of all have to have a profession of faith. We have to have the right candidate that they have to be saved because baptism doesn't save anybody. Jesus saves them. Baptism is just a picture that we have to have the right candidate. We have to have the right authority. Who is the authority? Not a pastor. It is the local church. The pastor is just the representative working on behalf of the church, but it is the local church that has the authority to baptize. That with it, we have the right mode. What do we mean by that? The right mode mode is immersion, meaning to go all the way under. The word baptism is a transliterated word, which means to immerse, to go all the way under. Why? It is a picture that Jesus died, he was buried, and then he rose again. And God wants to illustrate this picture to everyone else of what we're trusting in. Which brings us to the last thing of baptism, that it has to have the right purpose. What is the purpose of baptism? Not for salvation, not to wash away my sins, but for obedience... And for identification. What do you mean by obedience? Well, think about baptism. Baptism doesn't save you. Doesn't wash away your sins. So you mean to tell me that I get in front of a bunch of strangers. Go into the water in front of them and come out wet. And nothing spiritual or magical happen? Yep. Then why do it? To see if you're going to be obedient. It's the first step of obedience side of a Christian to see if you're willing to obey. And if you're willing to obey that, you're probably willing to obey something else. Well, baptism does something for a church that it makes sure that only saved people are a member of the church. Now, we have people who can visit and we're glad to visit. But in order to be a member of this church, they first of all have to have a biblical baptism. So therefore, the only people who are members of the church are saved people. Why? Because only saved people can be directed by God in the life of a church to be able to seek after him. The Lord's Supper on the same vein is also for the life of the church. Meaning whereas the Lord, the baptism makes sure that a church is pure by only having saved membership, the Lord's Supper is keeps a church pure by making sure that membership is as right with God as they know how to be. Now with that, let's examine that in 1 Corinthians chapter number 11. And notice with me, if you don't mind, as we see this, starting at verse number 24. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 24. The first thing that we see about the Lord's Supper is that it's commemorative. It's commemorative. Notice with me in verse 24. And when he had taken thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of of me. After the same manner also he took the cup and when he had supped saying this cup is the new testament in my blood this do ye as oft as you do drink it in remembrance of me. When we talk about the Lord's Supper, we understand first of all, it is commemorative. It's done for the purpose of remembering what Jesus did for us. He died for us. His blood was shed for us. Why? Because of our sin. It was our sin that put him on the cross. It was our sin that he died for. And we need to remember, he died in my place. It's a time of seriousness. It's a time where we remember what Jesus did for us. Notice something else that we understand with the um, Lord's Supper. Not only is it commemorative, it is pictorial. It is pictorial. Verse 26. For as oft as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death. We understand that this is a picture. It pictures the Lord's death. We are not having Jesus Christ killed over and over and over so we can observe the Lord's Supper. We understand it is a picture, just like baptism is a picture that Jesus died and was buried and rose again, that this helps us to remember about Jesus by having a picture, something for us to picture what happened. The We remember his blood was shed. We remember his body was broken. It is a picture. It is pictorial. 
Something else interesting that is often forgot about the Lord's Supper is not only is it commemorative, it's pictorial, it is prophetic. It is prophetic. Notice the end of verse number 26. For as oft as you eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Oh, this is our great hope. Remember that Jesus just didn't die. He was buried in a borrowed tomb. And on the third day, he rose again. And then he was ascended up to heaven. And he is coming back. This is an act of faith when we observe the Lord's Supper. That God's work is not finished. He is coming back to finish all that he promised for us. And it is by faith. Our faith and hope is in Jesus Christ. And what he has done for us. It is prophetic. Notice as we also understand. It is symbolic. It is symbolic. Now these are pictures of the Lord Jesus Christ as we said. They do not actually become the body and blood of Jesus. They are not. We know that some of our other friends of Christian religions will say that they actually are the body, body and blood of Jesus Christ. There are some that say it's a cracker until you put it in your mouth and then it becomes the body. Let me tell you we're not cannibals and we're not vampires. This is a picture. It is symbolic. Now because they are symbolic, they need a picture the purity of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm not going to turn there for the sake of time. But 1 Corinthians chapter 5 speaks about this. That we understand why do we use unleavened bread? Because leaven is a picture of corruption, of flesh. That we use unleavened bread to show the purity of the Lord Jesus Christ. At the same time, vain, we also use grape juice, not wine. The Bible goes to great lengths to always say cup of the vine when it deals with the Lord's Supper. Never uses the word wine. Never. So it doesn't confuse. We know the word wine in the Bible is often freshly squeezed grape juice. But just so there's no confusion, it always uses the fruit of the vine, freshly squeezed grape juice, this idea of a non-alcoholic beverage. Why? Well, 1 Corinthians chapter 5 explains more that you understand that in order to make alcohol, you have to add an additive called yeast, which is the same thing as leaven. You have to put an impurity inside of it, which ruins the picture of Jesus Christ and his purity. Now, it's what we're saying is that it is a picture. It is symbolic. Something else about the Lord's Supper is that it is purifying, which ties in what I just said about Ezra chapter 9 to here. Notice with me in 1 Corinthians 11 verse 27. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty-seven. 27. Wherefore, so because of all of this we just told you, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of of the Lord. Now we know in a sense that we're all unworthy, meaning that we're all sinners, but that's not what it's speaking about here. What is it speaking about? Well, let's see verse 28. But let a man examine himself, so let him eat that bread and drink of the cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, worthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. What are we speaking about? When someone comes to the Lord's Supper, and they will not examine themselves. They will not be thoroughly right with God. They will not take the time to allow God to search them out and refuse to confess the sin. Now I understand there are sins and there are pet sins that people like to keep. When it comes time to the Lord's Supper, God is expecting for us to be honest and realistic with ourselves. And to examine ourselves compared to His glory, His perfection, His light. And examine ourselves and take the time to get thoroughly right with him. How serious is God for this? Verse 30. For this cause, for this reason, for this cause, many are sick, weak and sickly among you. And many sleep. Do you know that not observing the Lord's Supper correctly, God actually sends a 
spiritual judgment. And there are some people who become physically weak. They become very sickly because they're not willing to get thoroughly right with God. Now is it because God hates them? He's trying to work to bring them to himself. That's the whole purpose is for them to get right. He's not trying to punish them to get back at them because they're being mean to him. He's trying to get rid of these things and trying to put the pressure on so they will examine themselves. Even to the degree, it says many sleep. The word sleep is a nice, kind Bible word that means they're dead. This is something God takes so seriously that he will actually put judgment upon someone, even to the idea of death, if they refuse to get right with God. You say, preacher, you're scaring me. I'm not trying to scare you, but I'm trying to make this serious. Trying to understand that this is not a playtime. This is a time where we're seeking after God for the purpose of God working in our midst. If we want revival, if we want God's power and what God can do, it starts with us being dead to self. It's for us being thoroughly right with God. For us being as clean and right with God as we possibly can. And so as we now approach this time, we want to put a time for us to examine ourselves. Now remember the word confession just means agreeing with God. When you're confessing your sin, you're not telling on yourself, God already knows. You're not telling him something he didn't know. What you are doing is agreeing with God with what he already knows and getting thoroughly right with him for the purpose that now he could put blessings and power and use our lives And our church to see his work get accomplished. And so if you don't mind, we're going to go to the Lord in prayer in just a moment. And when we do, we want to invite you to take the time to respond. Don't just take 30 seconds and then bounce back. But take your time and be thorough. Someone once went to D.L. Moody when he was doing something like this and they said, what if I don't know what sins I have? He says, guess at them. I bet you you'll guess right the first time. Take your time to be thorough. Let God give him permission to examine your life. There may be something you don't even realize is wrong. This is a time where he will take and examine your life to make sure you are as thoroughly right with him as possible as we now discern his death. Why did he die? He died because of our sins. He died to give us freedom of our sins. He died so we don't have to sit anymore. He wants us to be thoroughly right with him. Thank you for listening to this audio message. This is Pastor Scotty Bockhaus, and I encourage you to take this information that you just received and make a specific decision to follow after the Lord. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, let me beg you to take the time to receive Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. If you are saved, I encourage you to make a decision in your life to help you get closer with the Lord. If there's anything specific we can do to be a blessing or to pray for you, we encourage you. Look us up on the internet at riverviewbc.com. Once again, that's riverviewbc.com. Or if you would prefer to call us, you can give us a call at area code 920 530-6308. Once again, that number is 920-530-6308. If there's anything we can do to be a blessing or an encouragement to you, please let us know. We would love to make ourselves available. Thank you.